I have been asked to, to talk about the importance of resilient institutions in Africa's security sector. But I've also been told to be very, very brief and succinct. An impossible task, uh, talking about such a broad subject. So I'll, I'll try my best. I tend to speak extremely fast. Uh, I hope the interpreters are prepared for that. Or maybe I, sh I should actually talk a lot, take from the ambassador and speak a bit more slowly. Uh, because I'm a little out of my lane here. As uh, you, you recall from the introduction, I'm a lawyer by training, a human rights activist, and in many respects, have been in this oppositional position situation with uh, issues of security and the military. And so in my past, I was considered an Afro-pessimist because I, I, I often say terribly negative things about what is going on in the continent. I've, I've grown a bit older now, so I'm, 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 less, I'm, I'm less so. Still a bit queasy about Africa, uh, but uh, I, perhaps the age has been taken off a little bit, so I'm not as, as, uh, as punchy as I used to be. Uh, in the interest of time, I will make a few very general remarks about the relationship between policies, strategies, and plans on the one hand, and the implementation of those policies, strategies uh, on the other. The overall point I want to make, and to emphasize here, is that although it seems like an obvious and logical point, that in order for the policies and strategies that we have adopted to be realized, you need to have institutions with the capabilities to implement those policies and strategies. The reality is that in practice, that is often not the case. There is usually a very, very big gap. What we find is that in many of our countries, we have, an, and I, sp I limit it to Africa here, but you could expand this point more generally, but let me just talk specifically about Africa. In many, many of our countries, we do have very elaborate policies. We have written beautiful strategies and may even have plans in place. About 25 years ago when I was working for the World Bank, I had the privilege of traveling across the continent and I would meet with ministries of planning and so on. So literally every single issue that we wanted to discuss, there was an extensive plan on the books. Very, very well written. You look through them and uh, you can't really raise any questions, except for one thing, that the consistent experience that we have all over the continent is that the overwhelming majority of these policies and strategies are never implemented. They are not implemented at all. Let me share with you uh, a few examples from the field of development where I have a little bit of, uh, uh, of, of, uh, of experience. As I said earlier, most countries have very, very good policies and strategies on literally every aspect of development, on agriculture. Many of us want to mechanize. We want to expand markets. We want to provide water for our farmers across the entire country, do irrigation. We want value addition in order to get a little bit more out of our uh, agricultural crops. In education, Fantastic policies. We want to expand educational opportunities for everybody. We want every child to be able to go to school. We want a literate society. We want a powerful, very important uh, tertiary educational system. We want all children who go to school to have food. School feeding programs have been adopted. In the area of health, primary health care, we want every citizen to have access to basic health facilities. We want to deal with some of the most contagious diseases, and so on and so on and so on. You probably have better experiences than me. All these policies are down there uh, on, the, uh, on the ground. Consistent evaluation of these strategies and policies, however, over 40, 50, 60 years, and I think uh, our moderator here might have a lot better experience than this, having served with the ADB for many years as an executive director, is that whether it is the African Development Bank, the World Bank, the IMF, bilateral institutions, and even our own governments, their consistent evaluations at the end of the day is that these policies are not implemented. In some cases, even the money that has been borrowed is not disbursed. It's not uncommon to find 50, 60 percent of the money that we've borrowed to implement projects not used at all. We return them. Loans are unused. 
Numerous explanations have been offered for these abysmal results. We have argued that we don't have enough money. I'm not sure that that is sustainable. If you have enough money, why do you return it? We have talked about capacity lacking, and uh, decades have been spent on trying to build capacity. Corruption has been cited as an issue, and I think we could have legendary stories about corruption in every one of our countries, whether it is in the health sector or the infrastructure sector, whatever the case may be. We have talked about lack of political will. I think all of these things are plausible arguments in any given situation. Corruption is certainly an issue. Lack of capacity is certainly a problem. Uh, perhaps the way is not, not so much the presence of money, but the way that we distribute and use that money might be uh, an, an issue. Political will is extremely important. Uh, it's unclear in many cases whether the leaders are actually quite keen on ensuring that these things have been implemented. But I think there's a little bit more to that. And that's part of what I want to spend a little bit more time on. Looking more closely at a lot of studies and analysis that have been undertaken in the last uh, five to 10 years by students of development who have looked very closely at, uh, at, at the issue. And uh, b before I go to what they say, it's actually quite depressing because the overall point that came f comes from some of this analysis is that unless we do a fundamental change in the way that we undertake this issue of development, it may be 60 to 100 years in some cases for many of our countries to get on track. And that is very scary to think that in your generation and the generation that follows and perhaps that after that, we're going to be mired in exactly the same kind of, uh, kind of situation. But let me talk a little bit more about uh, uh, about the policy dimension, the institutional dimension here. The conclusion that many of these analysts have come to is that uh, the biggest challenge of development is the fact that the institutions lack the capability to implement those. And this is not just a question of capacity. In many, many cases, in fact, we do have things that look like institutions. There are schools with the teachers. There is a blackboard in the schools. Uh, they have chalk. They have all the things that appear. Hospitals are the same. You go to the hospitals, you will find a facility that looks like a hospital. There are people who wear you know, gowns, look like doctors. <laughs> but yet, they are not functioning. They are not delivering on, on, on the promises. And that is the biggest puzzle, really. But it is clear that the focus now is uh, uh, very much in that. Let me go back to my, the, the, the example uh, of, of education for a moment. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there are policies on universal primary education, for example. It's not delivered. Uh, the argument here could be, and, and I think what they present with respect to the, the issue of, uh, from an institutional dimension, is that uh, the educational uh, sector may not be really properly uh, organized for this purpose. And that there is a disconnect between the policies that we have in the books and their implementation uh, on the ground. And that, that could be explained by any number of uh, factors, the issue of resources we have talked about earlier, probably proper remuneration, money doesn't float down to the people who should be having that. There are issues related to systems of accountability Nobody's really looking at what the teachers are doing in the classroom and whether they show up at all. In, in my own village in, in, in Uganda, uh, there are many, many instances where teachers don't even come to school. When I was growing up, it was impossible to, to hear about a teacher not coming to school. That would be considered a tragedy. The whole village would come on you. And the schools were, by the way, within the village. And I remember, I'm, I'm not such a young man in the 60s as a, as a, a young kid going to school the government of Uganda had one very simple policy. They want every child in Uganda to be within hearing of the school bell. So that when the bell rings, you are at your home, but you can run, and you are going to be in line before it is time for everybody uh, to line up. 
parents were very active in the school system. Teachers were accountable. There was a way in which messages were sent back and forth about this teacher is not doing a good job, such and such is a, is a drunkard, doesn't come here, this, this one is abusive in the class environment and so on. All of these things were, were, would come out. So the, the, the issue of accountability is, is important. And I think part of what is argued here is that no one takes account of the results anymore and nobody is accountable for delivering on, uh, on, 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 those, uh, on, on, on those on on those results. So I'll, I'll leave the point here, but maybe take a little bit of time and I'll be very brief here. Why does it happen? Why is it that we have this gap? Why are the institutions not sufficiently capable of uh, uh, fulfilling the uh, objectives for which uh, they are uh, set up? I think there are a number of reasons, and, and, and I, I, I float this for your consideration. You may have your own uh, ideas here. But let me just point to about four or five. One is uh, part of the problem of that uh, Ambassador Carter referred to earlier, planning in silos. Silos within sectors and across sectors. All of our wonderful plans sometimes are designed by people who are sitting in offices in the capital. They are not linked up to the people who are doing the implementation at the end of the day. And so you find a very, a very big gap. Across, it means the people in education, the people in the security sector, are all each doing their own thing. They are not talking to each other. That makes it ex extremely difficult. Secondly, it has just become normal practice that we don't do enough analysis about the institutional requirements. Uh, in my experience working in the United Nations and with government, uh, it has been extremely rare. The planning part is actually the tail end of the process. We do all these documents, and then at the very end, somebody comes up and says, oh, by the way, how do we make these things work? And because we have set ourselves a timeline, a deadline for putting these plans in place, we very quickly then go through the process and say, OK, this organ here will be responsible for implementing this and the other. But generally speaking, very, very little emphasis on the implementation. What resources are required? What sort of capacity you need to you have in place? What sort of incentive systems need to be uh, done? And so on and so on. The third possible explanation is the issue of copying and pasting. We call it best practices. We're supposed to be borrowing, you know, the best practice from this country or the other and so on. I don't have time to elaborate on this, but I think the real issue here is that when you copy and paste, that organic element is missing. And if you, you add all of the other issues that I talked about earlier, it certainly means that the plan is really hanging in the air. It does not have an owner. There is no home. It's not related to anything organic that is happening. At the, at the country level. And, and, and strangely, in the field of development, actually, you hear a lot about leapfrogging. Africa can't begin to learn all these things. We need to leapfrog. You know, we need to, to learn from what the others are doing. But the context is missing. And without that context, I think it's extremely difficult to go forward. I think we also underestimate the complexity of our challenges when we do that. And I think that is an important point when you're looking at it from the security point of view. These issues are not simple. It is not a simple fact that when you put up a school somewhere or a, a dispensary, the rest will follow. It doesn't follow automatically. These are very, very complex things. It requires a lot of different elements uh, to, to, make it, uh, to make it work. I talked about the issue of accountability earlier. I think that lack of accountability mechanisms is another reason. But uh, I think the, the, the overall point, and I will not belabor this, is that the consequences of institutional failure are profound. Not only do you not get to deliver on the strategies and plans that you have in place, but also literature now suggests that there are a lot more insidious consequences across society as a whole. There are issues of uh, uh, cynicism that develop. We begin to uh, engage into uh, very, very negative habits. People go to the offices with their jackets. They are not really prepared to work. Uh, as uh, one uh, interesting person put it many years ago, you know, we pretend to work, they pretend to pay us, and so we go on on a daily basis. Uh, and, 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 and we write wonderful reports about what is going on, but that cynicism is self-fulfilling. Uh, it goes on from year to year, and the situation never really changes because nobody wants to get into that. And then there is the other element that I think most of you probably encounter, the rent-seeking dimension of our, of our behaviors, where in order for you to be able to get anything at all, you have to part with something. So the, the logic of the institution, the purpose for which it is said, the policies and ideologies are irrelevant. It is more now what is paid that makes things happen. Or uh, the capture of the state by a few. 
So you have to look for some powerful person somewhere to take you, whether it is medicine you want or a title to your land to be given or a child to get into a particular uh, school or a job to be given to your relative and what have you. This is the nature of the predatory state that has developed as a result of this institutional uh, failure. Now, what is the relevance? I, I realize my time is running up here, so I'll, I'll sum up very quickly. What is the relevance of this for the security sector? Three sets of questions. Number one, which I think is the most fundamental question here, is the security sector different from the rest of our organs in society? I'm not going to attempt to answer that before security people. I leave that with you as a question. Uh, but sometimes when you look at the way that the police behaves, you see the issues of uh, mandates and how the security sector is dragged into doing things that are far beyond, I think what we referred to earlier on, doing things that perhaps they should not be doing, how promotions and, and recruitments in the security sector is done, one begins to wonder if maybe the same maladies are not also witnessed in the, uh, in the security sector. The other point here, of course, is that uh, all of these issues have a very, very direct bearing on security. When health is not delivered, when education is not done, uh, when the infrastructure is not well, when people are unemployed, when food are not, all these are security issues. At the end of the day, they have a very direct impact uh, on, uh, on, uh, on, on, on security. So let me leave this point here as a hanging one more, as a set of questions, rather than attempting to give you answers. Uh, but I think I'll conclude here with just the, the, the point I started with here is that institutions are absolutely critical. Without institutions, the goals and objectives that you have set in place, whether it is to deliver security or healthcare or uh, infrastructure and water and what have you, will not be realized. The cost of failure is extremely high and can be catastrophic. I think in the field of security, which I know very little about, uh, it's an intangible. So sometimes we may not even get to measure whether we're actually living up to it. But it may be one of those situations where you look really, really good in your uniforms and drills and performances and trucks and what have you, but when it comes to actually delivering security, maybe it is not there. So my final point is, this is one thing that as a leader one really needs to look, take a very hard look at, because it has profound consequences for our ability to deliver on our mandates. Thank you very much.